Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Okay so as I had mentioned uh, after the mid sem we will start uh, looking at deep neural network for natural language processing and uh, Next semester, I am giving a full course on deep neural networks for deep learning for natural language processing. So that will delve uh, in more detail into the interaction of natural language processing and neural networks. But uh, let me introduce, you know, by way of uh, tackling natural language processing problems by a powerful technique, which has happened in recent times last uh, five, five, seven, eight years, I would say. So uh, this is the matrix that we have seen before. This is task versus technique matrix. Uh, on the uh, rows, we have the pipeline of NLP or the NLP stack. Going from morphology, which deals with uh, the formation of words, starting from root or stem going up to large applications like machine translation, semantic role labeling, sentiment question answering, and so on. Named entity recognition, parsing, chunking, these are again important building block blocks and are important problems on their own right. However, the attraction of NLP comes from these uh, lower rows mentioning machine translation, semantic role, labeling, question answering, and so on. So NLP has been found to be useful in real life, but it is uh, based on foundational tasks like morphology, part of speech tagging, chunking, and so on. So you have done assignments on part of speech tagging, chunking, you are working on uh, parsing, where you have to transform dependency parts to constituency and vice versa, which should give you insight into how these frameworks work. Uh, we need to complete a probabilistic parsing algorithm. The main problem there being, we know that the probability of a parse tree is uh, the product of the rules applied in constructing the parse tree. Now, through uh, a problem in your mid sem, you have understood that a sentence can have multiple parse trees. And therefore, if you have to compute the probability of each parse tree, ab initio, then this is not very efficient because each parse tree has subtrees which are common with other parse trees. So you should use dynamic programming, Viterbi-like algorithm, uh, which exists in parsing also. It's called inside-outside algorithm, which is like Peter B in uh, hidden Markov model. So uh, we have to do this, and we also have to do uh, algorithm for dependency parsing. The most famous algorithm is transition-based dependency parsing. So we'll go back to those ideas. Now we would like to spend some time on the neural technique for natural language processing. Where do these two fields meet? Why has neural network been found to be useful in NLP? And to my happiness, I also found yesterday that about 40 groups in the class have been very creative, innovative in choosing their project topics. While doing a substantial project, you really get a good insight into the area. Okay, what exactly is the problem of natural language processing, even if you are solving only one problem? And uh, it will come back to you again and again that it is the ambiguity and therefore choosing amongst multiple options by classification, which is the key point where machine learning. And there were some groups where data was a problem and Quite wisely, the groups talked about uh, using rule bases. Okay, where, where there is no data, what can you do? You have to 
understand the problem, uh, go inside your own brain and pick the brain for creating rules. So on the horizontal horizontal rows, we have uh, problems from NLP, the tasks, and on the columns, we have uh, techniques, rules, classical machine learning, deep learning. So we are delving into deep learning now, though it will be a, uh, an introduction. So our agenda is to introduce neural network as a framework for deep learning. Now, deep learning has been a catchy phrase. Okay, what is shallow learning? What is deep learning? But for NLP, uh, the word deep learning is little more meaningful than other areas. Because in NLP itself, we have shallow NLP and deep NLP. So shallow NLP is part of speech tagging, chunking, which doesn't require huge amount of contextual information. Doesn't have to go deep into the structure of the sentence, meaning of the sentence, structure of the paragraph, meaning of the paragraph, pragmatics, and no, and so on. Discourse, no. So uh, deep NLP is really semantic role leveling, constituency dependency parsing, then uh, applications like question answering, text inference. So we have to do perceptron, feed forward network, uh, then recurrent network, then NLP and neural net. So this is the broad agenda for the week, but of course, it has happened before that we could not complete everything decided as agenda for the week, but that is okay. We can come back to topics. Uh, somebody please verify you're seeing the slide stages of development. Can you please verify? Yes, sir. Stages of development. Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. Now stages of development in uh, reaching deep learning. Perceptron came first which was a single neuron with connections. Uh, we'll study perceptron. This gave way to feed forward neural network where it was understood single perceptrons are not powerful enough, but assembly of perceptrons, just like in the brain, neurons, uh, assembly of neurons is very powerful. Assembly of neurons is powerful. And that, that assembly, one is the feed forward neural network that, that uses back propagation algorithm. Has been found to be extremely useful across disciplines in civil engineering, mechanical engineering, economics, sociology, everywhere you see application of feed forward neural network. In parallel with feed forward neural network, the theory of recurrent neural networks was getting developed. And as you can surmise from the names themselves that in feed forward neural network, connections go forward from input to the output layer. In recurrent, connections can come back okay, from one layer to another. So uh, you have computation where there is back and forth flow of information. In feed forward network, there is a back propagation algorithm. But you should not misunderstand this to mean same back and forth information transfer as in recurrent neural network, no. What gets back propagated in neural and uh, fit forward neural network is error, error back propagation. And that's an abstract quantity, it is, it is not a real signal. Then recurrent networks also were assembled in multiple layers, giving rise to famous frameworks called self organization and neocognitor. Neocognitor actually mimics the layers of brain and is very, very uh, reminiscent of today's deep neural networks. Neocognitron had many layers, okay? A layer, um, each layer feeding into the next. And recently there are uh, LSTMs, by LSTMs, gated recurrent unit, which have become very famous because of their problem solving ability in speech, vision, image processing, NLP robotics. 
Uh, feed for our network has been embellished with the softmax function. The early feed for our network introduced total sum square as the loss function. Softmax is based on probability. Okay, the difference of two probability distributions, which is captured by cross entropy or mutual entropy. Now, the most recent introduction is the technique of transformers. They came after RNN, and the main difference with RNN is that the data need not be sequential. So RNN will, will take a sentence, one word after another, left to right, right to left. If you have bi LSTM, you present the information left to right and right to left. But in transformers, it is possible to give the words in any order. Okay, so giving the words in any order mimics the way we understand sentences. It is not uh, totally the case that we do left to right scanning end to end. We go back and forth. We have done a lot of research on eye tracking in our uh, Seafield lab. And there we have seen how people's eye go from Another than going back, backing is called, reg is called regression, and how the eye rests for some time on a particular word. This is called fixation. So those cognitive studies we have done and combined them with machine learning. So transformers are a powerful framework where the sequentiality of input need not be maintained. Now at this point of time, uh, I would like to go into uh, some details on transformer because this is a very powerful technique and there are many different transformers which people have found useful in different applications before delving into fundamentals. Okay, so I'll spend time doing fundamental discussions on perceptron, feed forward network, recurrent network. But before that, let's see what is available to us as off the shelf tools, which are very powerful. So if you go to this site called Hugging Face, uh, that is the uh, site which records various kinds of transformers and also gives you access to those tools through GitHub and the corresponding papers, research papers which support that transformer is also given. So very, very useful resource. Maybe some of you already know it. Maybe some of you are already using it, but I thought that I will at least list those transformers at one place which you can refer back to after your fundamentals are cleared on a neural network. So BART is from Google, very famous these days. It was released with the paper BART pre-training of deep bidirectional transformer for language understanding by Jacob Devlin, Min Wei Chang, Kenton Lee, and Christina Tutanova. This is from Google. Then comes GPT, which is from OpenAI. Corresponding paper is Improving Language Understanding by Generative Pre-Training by Radford et al. GPT-2 again came from OpenAI. Now there is GPT-3 also. Language models are unsupervised multitask learners by Radford et al. Transformer Excel is from Google and CMU, released with the paper Transformer Excel, Attentive Language Models Beyond a Fixed Length Context by Ziang Dai et al. ExcelNet is from Google and CMU, corresponding paper ExcelNet Generalized Autoregressive Pre-Training for Language Understanding by Zilin Yang et al. So autoregressive uh, technique is something which we'll see being used for dimensionality reduction and is at the heart of representation. XLM is from Facebook, cross-lingual language model pre-training by Lampel and Konyo. Very famous uh, framework for deep neural network. Roberta is again from Facebook, robustly optimized BART pre-training approach by Liu et al. Distilled BART is little lighter Distilled BART, a distilled version of BART, smaller, faster, cheaper, and lighter by San et al. The same has been applied to compress GPT-2 into distilled GPT-2. CTRL is from Salesforce. 
CTRL, a conditional transformer language model for controllable generation. What is control? Uh, what is conditional about it? Conditional uh, because you use conditional probabilities, okay, as opposed to let's say joint probabilities. So interaction of probability and neural network. How neural network makes use of probability values as as parameters. This um, is uh, something we need to take note of. Then Camembert is from again, Facebook research. Facebook research, FAIR is Facebook AI research. And Camembert, a tasty French language model by Martin et al. Albert again is from Google research. Albert, a light bird for self supervised learning of language representations by Zhenzong Lan et al. T5 from Google. I used to hear about it maybe six, seven months before. Exploring the limits of transfer learning with a unified text to text transformer by Rafael et al. XLM Loberta is from Facebook AI research again. Unsupervised cross lingual representation learning at scale by Connu et al. MMBT is from Facebook. Supervised multimodal bit transformers for classifying images and text. Flaubert is from CNRS. CNRS is the government scientific body, highest scientific body in France. Flaubert, a um, unsupervised language model pre-training for French. Flaubert was a dramatist, very famous French dramatist. Bart, uh, this is B-A-R-T from Facebook. Bart denoising sequence to sequence pre-training for natural language generation, translation and comprehension. Bart is being extensively used in machine translation by Louis et al. Electra from Google Research in Stanford University. One of the groups yesterday mentioned Electra. Or uh, to be used in their project. Electra pre-training text encoders as discriminators rather than generators. Let us note this discriminator rather than generator phrase because I would like to spend five minutes on discriminator generator, discriminating algorithms and generating algorithms, uh, generative model, discriminative model, the, the difference thereof. And you had a question in which I'm underlining the difference between discriminating model and generating model. Dialogpt is from Microsoft Research. Dialogpt, large scale generative pre training for conversational response generation by Zhang et al. A reformer from Google Research, reformer, the efficient transformer by Kitayev et al. Marian MNT, MT, developed by Microsoft Translator team. Machine transition models trained using OPAS pre training. Data by Jorg Tiedemann. Long former is from Allen AI. Long former, the long document transformer by Beltagi et al. DPR is from Facebook. Dense passage retrieval for open domain question answering by Karpukhin et al. Pegasus, somebody mentioned this for their project yesterday from Google again. Pegasus pre-training with extracted gap sentences for abstractive summarization by Zhang et al. And finally, MBART from Facebook released with the paper Multilingual Denoising Pre-training for Neural Machine Translation by Liu et al. LXSmart is from UNC Chapel Hill. LXSmart learning cross-modality encoder representations from transformers for open domain question answering by Tan and Bansal. Funnel transformer is from CMU Google Brain. Funnel transformer filtering out sequential redundancy for efficient language processing by Dai et al. Bard for sequence generation from Google, leveraging pre-trained checkpoints for sequence generation task, Rote et al. Layout M from Microsoft Research Asia. Layout LM, pre-training of text and layout for document image understanding by Sue et al. So this is a listing of various transformers which are all put together at one place, very beneficial for researchers. But we have to understand that transformer is preceded by RNN or rather GRU by LSTM, preceded by LSTM and RNN in parallel with feed forward network. 
So, so you know, you will be able to use this PyTorch, TensorFlow, and these transformer models, but without an insight into how they work, what is at the back of all these tools, uh, you really cannot do any deep work. Okay, so we need to understand the fundamentals behind all this framework. Now, uh, uh, these transformers have been used in sequence classification. Sequence classification is like a sentiment analysis problem where you give the classification level, positive sentiment or negative sentiment. Extractive question answering where you decide for each sentence whether it should belong to the summary or not. It becomes a classification problem again. Language modeling is predicting the next piece of text, which is important for any kind of natural language generation. For example, in machine translation, summarization, uh, question generation, and so on. Named entity recognition, we know proper nouns have to be distinguished from common nouns, very important. In Indian languages, we do not have capitalization to separate proper nouns from common nouns. So, puja ne, puja ne puja ke liye full kharida. So first puja is named entity, second puja is common noun. Summarization, translation, these, all these tasks have been uh, benefited by making use of transformers. And there may be a question in your mind, why these, these, these are called transformers? Well, the main point, transformers transform the pre-trained encoding pre-trained embedding that you obtain for isolated words from large corpus. In the context, their embedding so, should change. Okay, so that is the main role of the transformer. And the models which have been used in these transformers are autoregressive, autoencoding, sequence to sequence, multimodal, retrieval based, and so on. So all this information is from the website of Hugging Face. You can take a look at them but it is good to put them in the slide and link them with uh, foundational ideas in, in, the, in the framework. Now, discriminative generative comes in many discussions. You saw one of the phrases, uh, discriminative in preference to generative. Now, neural networks are predominantly discriminative models. Okay, those are something called generative adversarial networks where there is generative model also. Now it is important to understand the difference between discriminative and generative model. So these slides were there in this in the lecture slides of 28 September before your mid sem So you took a look at uh, these slides. And there was a question in the class also, what is the exact difference between discriminative generative? So let's understand that this difference is for historical reasons. Okay, Once you delve into the literature and see how did, um, the, how did this term come about, then you see that the reason is historical. For sequence to sequence transformer, transformation tasks like machine translation, this difference is not very apparent. So can somebody tell me that you are seeing difference between discriminative generative models? Yes, sir. So the reason is historical. Classification started with a binary classification problem. Yes, no. There is such a huge number of problems in real life, so many situations which are uh, yes, no kind. So binary classification is a very important problem. So suppose I take a particular binary classification task. I want to decide if a patient has cancer based on different features from the reports and uh, diagnosis of the patient, physical examination of the patient. So reports of the patient obtained from let's say blood sample, then, uh, uh, then let's say other extracts from the body and so on. And the physical examination, you can see, you can very easily see, gives rise to a number of feature values for the patient. So age, gender, height, weight, CBC level in the blood, body temperature, pulse rate, 
Each of these is a feature and they have a value. The value can be binary also. Does the patient have fever? Yes or no? Okay. So you can uh, you can look up on the patient as a feature vector for the purpose of representation. So I'm mentioning the word representation, which has um, assumed a tremendous importance these days. Was always important because you people, all the computer scientists, have done a course on data structure. What is data structure? Data structure is nothing but representation of information inside the computer. So for us, the particular patient P has become a feature vector, F1, F2, up to Fn. So and we mentioned D, yes or no. D is yes or no. Has has cancer? Yes. Doesn't have cancer? Answer is no. So one or zero. And S is the set of features. So D takes values Y and N. So we decide uh, Y, D is Y, if probability of D equal to Y given S is greater than probability of D equal to N given S. If the yes probability is more than no probability, that's all. Okay. So now consider working with this formula, just this probability formula. Do nothing, just use this formula. Now you know that this S is becoming a feature vector. Age, sex, uh, body condition, it is an N length feature vector. Now I have to make a decision one or zero. So I can think of a discriminator. I can think of a black box where all these feature values go in and out comes the decision one or zero. This one zero many times may be not exactly one and zero, but some value which also is associated with the threshold. If the value is below a threshold, the answer is zero, else the answer is one. So this is this black box is doing a discrimination based on the feature values. Patient P1 and patient P2. P1 has cancer, P2 doesn't have. Feature values lead to that conclusion. They go through the, a black box and the decision comes out. So this is the understanding of the discriminative model. Now an interesting thing, thing comes. Suppose I do not compute P, D given S directly. Why? What I do is that I use Bayes theorem on the argmax value P, D given S and isolate the prior probability P, D and the likelihood of S given D. See that the probability is turned around now. It is not, we are interested in probability of D given S but are working with probability of S given D. Okay, and we have to take this. Whichever uh, decision has higher value for P D into P S given D, that is the decision we output. How do I compute with this P D and P S D? P S given D. So for P D, we'll need the proportion of cancer patients in the population. This is obtained by sampling. Suppose I sample 10,000 people in the city and find that, um, you know, 30, 36 people have cancer. Then 36 by 10,000 is the probability of cancer. For the likelihood, we make use of the naive base assumption and re require the values of PFI given D. So you have to work with, you see, the whole feature vector f given d and the whole feature vector given d that means all these conditions of the body given the fact that the has cancer i want that probability and that probability i compute by maximum likelihood estimate i find out how many times a cancer patient has these feature values okay so so you take S comma D, find out S comma D and divide it by total number of Ds. So that will be the probability value. 
But now problem is that this whole feature may not appear as such in the training data. Then I'll have to make use of a naive Bayes assumption. I assume that each feature is independent. We know this is absolutely not true. Okay, the condition of having fever cannot be independent of an infection in liver. No, not possible. But still we make naive Bayes assumption and we compute these data statistics, probability of fever given cancer. So probability of fever given cancer will require you to find out how many ca cancer patients have fever. So take the whole population of cancer patients and find out how many of them have fever, take the ratio and you get the statistic probability of fragmenting. So do you see that this is not at all like asking a, a yes no question okay you are generating the feature value given the class condition okay given the class find out the feature value of course you can play with language okay and say that uh, isn't this also discrimination does the cancer patient have fever or what is the value of CBC for a cancer patient? What is the value of CBC for a cancer patient is not a yes no question. Okay, you can do that. But you see that the point of view is completely changed. Now, given the class, I want to find out the feature value. This is very, very different from asking, given the feature vector, what is the class? Okay, so given the class, what is the feature value is different. That's why this is called a generative model. Now this difference gets obliterated. It becomes fuzzy when you go to machine translation. So I want to find out the probability of the best Hindi sentence given the English sentence. This is a translation situation. Now if I directly find out the probability of the Hindi sentence given the English sentence, I'm operating with discriminative model. I'm not uh, um, you know, applying Bayes theorem. But if I apply Bayes theorem, it will be probability of in this sentence into probability of English sentence given the English sentence. Now there is no difference between probability of Hindi sentence given English sentence and probability of English sentence given Hindi sentence. Both are identical. So the generative discriminative model difference gets obliterated when it comes to sequence to sequence transformation. It is better understood when I take a classification problem. OK, and uh, the, re the, re the reason for this term's discriminative generative is a historical reason. OK, so do remember this difference. And uh, in the mid -sem, actually, there was a qu question based on this understanding. So if the class generates the features, it is a uh, generative model. So let's proceed and uh, we would like to take up this very famous discriminative model called neural network. Before that, there is some perspective. So AI perspective, are you seeing this slide called AI perspective? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. OK, so artificial intelligence is divided into core areas, search, reasoning, machine learning. And the uh, areas, utility areas like robotics, NLP, information retrieval, computer vision, expert systems. Planning is an interesting case. Planning is applied to robotics. A part of planning is really core AI. OK, so there is an important, uh, uh, important distinction between planning and learning. There is a huge school of AI researchers who think planning is more fundamental than learning. OK. So planning a sequence of actions, planning the trajectory of the autonomous vehicle, planning the path of a robot. These are crucial AI problems. Information retrieval is a recent entry into this picture. Now search is A star search, breadth first, depth first search. Reasoning is logic, predicate calculus, propositional calculus. Learning is all those SPM, decision tree, uh, neural networks, conditional random field and so on. OK, so the techniques come from the inner circle. Techniques are consumed in the outer circle. Now, uh, we know the traditional AI, which is based on symbols. It is essentially Turing machine computation. So you have symbols on the tape. 
a finite state machine looks at the tape and changes state. Now, uh, there is something called physical symbol system hypothesis, which is very deep. This is due to um, Alan Newell. Alan Newell and Simon. Newell and Simon. Which says that every intelligent system can be constructed by storing and processing symbols and nothing more is necessary. There is a deep statement if you see it. Intelligence is reduced to symbol processing. You see? So there was a question in the class sometime back. Where is the AI? Where is the intelligence in AI systems? After all, everything is data structure, algorithm, symbol manipulation. So that is it. The symbol, physical symbol system hypothesis, which came in the 70s, 60s and 70s, said that intelligence is nothing but that's all. And uh, therefore, uh, the field focused its attention to creating symbolic systems for AI. So there were models of computation like Turing machine, von Neumann machine, recursively enumerable sets, lambda calculus. So in Turing machine, there is this finite state head which moves over the infinite tape, looking at each symbol and changing the state, writing new symbols, updating a symbol. Updating a symbol is deleting a symbol and inserting a new symbol. In von Neumann machine, we have CPU and the main memory. There is information transfer over the data bus and address bus. Now, von Neumann machine and Turing machine are equivalent. Uh, as is lambda calculus, recursively enumerable sets, and neural networks. Now, uh, why did neural network come? A new paradigm came, which is called connectionist AI. So that is different from symbolic AI. So there were uh, disturbing differences in the way and in the way nature organized intelligence animals, human beings. So uh, natural intelligence is brain computation in living beings. Artificial intelligence is Turing machine computation in computers. Natural intelligence is very good in pattern recognition. Artificial intelligence or computers are good in numerical processing. Uh, human beings or animals are learning oriented. Computers are programming oriented. We see distributed and parallel processing in uh, human beings. In von Neumann machine, the processing is centralized and serial. In human beings, the memory is content addressable. In computers, memory is location addressable. You jam an address bus on an address on the address bus in, and you get the content from the main memory. In human beings, we part, uh, present part of the information and the whole information comes as if pulled by that part. So I'm fond of saying this later in life when we'll think of NLP. If you think of NLP, maybe you will think of me also. So NLP will bring uh, my face, my name uh, as if pulled by NLP. Similarly, when you hear my name, maybe we'll also think of NLP. This is called content addressable memory. You present part of the information, rest of the information comes in. So there are these crucial differences between human computation and, uh, and um, computation in computer, okay? And therefore artificial intelligence and natural intelligence. And human brain is another mystery and there is this uh, feeling that most of the Nobel Prizes, Turing Awards, etc., will come, which are based on uh, findings and research on what happens in human brain. Human brain is the seat of consciousness and cognition. Note the difference between the two words, consciousness and cognition. Okay, again, subtle difference. In artificial intelligence, we have to be conscious of language, cognition, philosophy. Those are very, very deep things. Only computation is not the essence of artificial intelligence. Okay, we need a much broader view, including philosophy, logic, language. 
scenes, expressions, and so on, and physics also. Perhaps the most complex information processing machine in nature, the brain is. Now it has been known through painstaking research in brain uh, science that higher brain is responsible for higher needs. This is the prefrontal cortex that distinguishes human beings from the rest of the living world. So we can uh, display sympathy, empathy, we can be kind, we can relate to others' needs and uh, relate to social concerns. This is the function of higher brain. Then there is lower brain. Higher brain makes humans humans, but lower brain makes living possible. This is what controls heartbeat, pulse rate, breathing. All these things are controlled at the lower brain. And every animal, every living being has this. Higher brain may be not present in many species. So lower brain is so important, you know, it is, this controls your living. And if there is malfunctioning in the lower brain or cerebrum, uh, we, we lose life. And then there is midbrain, which is between higher brain and lower brain. It is understood that the midbrain is like a router, okay, responsible for back and forth flow of information. So there are three layers, cerebrum, cerebellum, and higher brain. Uh, let me also mention that it has been found out that there are two parts of the brain, left brain and right brain. For right-handed people, the left brain deals with logic, number, and uh, right brain deals with gestalt, the overall picture. Okay, So suppose I meet one of you, and in one shot, in one go, I can make out uh, what, is, what your mood is, Okay, how we are oriented, the dress, the height, the uh, thinking pr process, the body language, everything I take in together. And this synthesis happens and a holistic picture emerges in the right brain. So an interesting fact which is known is that in music, the tune is managed by the right brain, sur is managed by the right brain, Left brain manages the words and the rhythm, tal and shabda. Okay, so therefore there is enormous benefit from music, which exercises the whole brain. Now the building blocks. For, so this right brain, left brain separation uh, got Roger Perry Nobel Prize, I think in the 70s. I don't remember the year. Now neuron is the uh, building block of the brain. A neuron is like a ball, small ball, which receives uh, inputs through incoming signal channels. They are called dendrites. Inside the neuron, there is cell body and action is, axon are the uh, nerve endings or channels which output information and send it to other neurons. So the brain has huge number of neurons, 10 to the power, I believe, 22, if I'm not wrong. And uh, these neurons communicate amongst themselves to do pattern recognition, make decisions. So a very complex machinery. Now inside the brain cell, interestingly, there is only sodium and potassium solution, sodium potassium solution. That's why you will, you must have heard that when we, when the sodium potassium level in the body falls, we begin to hallucinate. The brain begins to malfunction. So it is very dangerous to be a situation where sodium potassium level falls because these are the solutions which keep the brain alive. Now, uh, the modern day view of neuron is again like a stack. Now, it is not a, really a ball. It is a stack again. But research is going on and neurophysiology is bringing up new pieces of information for how, what the anatomy of neuron is. So we are talking about the classical neuron where neuron is looked upon as a ball. 
and uh, there are connections. So there is this perceptron model which was given uh, inspired by neuron. So please verify that you are looking at perceptron model slide. Hmm? Somebody? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So the output is Y and X1, X2 up to Xn is the input values. So X1, X2 up to Xn forms what is called the input vector. And the output Y is a scalar. Each connection has a weight, W1, W2 up to Wn. Now if you take the dot product of X vector and W vector, that means if you take component wise product and sum them up, then we have what is called the net, uh, the what is called the input arriving at the neuron. Now you subtract the threshold from the input arriving. So input minus threshold is called the net input. So if that net input is more than zero, then the output is one. Otherwise the output is zero. In other words, if the dot product of weight and input vector exceeds the threshold, then the output is one. Otherwise the output is zero. So then you can see that unlike the Turing machine, the perceptron ab initio right from the beginning is a classification device because its purpose is saying one or zero and thereby it puts the input values, input values into two classes, the positive class and the negative class. Now if you think of geometrically, then uh, each of these input vector is a point in the n-dimensional space. And uh, these points uh, form a kind of picture in the n-dimensional space. And uh, all the uh, points for which the output is one belong to the positive class and all the points for which the output is zero belong to the negative class. So this is such a powerful abs abstraction. Okay. This same machine is useful in deciding if the patient has cancer. So X1 to Xn are the feature values for the patient. Output is one if the patient has cancer. The same machine can decide if the bank should grant loan for this applicant or not. So again, inside input is a set of features for the applicant, age, income, gender, address, previous loan history, and so on. Output is one if the loan can be granted, otherwise not. Same machine can be, uh, can be used by, let's say the US consulate, the American embassy or French embassy to decide if the applicant can be granted visa to enter the country or not. If the output is one, give visa, else don't give visa. And what is input? The input is the person's social media history, income, education level, the, the reason for going to uh, that foreign country and so on. Same machine, see? So different problems, loan sanctioning, medical diagnosis, visa application granting, pass fail, a student, should the student pass or fail? So various input information about the student and pass fail information. So Perceptron came in the 60s and was immediately recognized as a natural classification computer, okay? So uh, uh, this is a single neuron with these connections and, uh, and uh, and the whole purpose is to compute. How does it compute? It's first of all, it aggregates the input by multiplying by the weights and taking the sum and comparing with the threshold. If the input exceeds threshold, output is one, else zero. So uh, the perceptron is a discriminator on the feature space. It is a discriminator. And what can we do with this perceptron? First and foremost, show that simple things can be done. Basic elementary things, however, which are fundamental can be done. So I want to compute and 
with this perceptron. I have the truth table of the AND function. X, if both x1 and x2 are 1, then only the output is 1, otherwise the output is 0. So it is AND can be looked upon as a classification problem where 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0 belong to negative class, 1, 1 belongs to the positive class. Now, what does computing AND mean? Computing means find out the parameter values. This is theta, W1 and W2. There are three parameters which control uh, whether the neuron is able to compute AND or not. At this point, let me mention to you, we are here talking about non-parametric estimation. Though I am using the term parameters, these parameters are not the parameters of a distribution. These parameters are parameters of a machine, of a neural network. So do not have that confusion that neural networks are also parametric estimators. They are not, because you are not starting with and uh, uh, with a a priori distribution and finding parameters for this. Where are we doing parametric, parametric estimation? When you did part of speech tagging, you found out the statistic, the data statistic, probability of NN given JJ. So how many times noun occurs after JJ, adjective. And that you found by ratio of JJ NN combination divided by total number of JJs or adjectives. So this is actually this, this P NN given JJ is the parameter of a multinomial distribution. You are not seeing the distribution, but there is an underlying distribution which is multinomial distribution in the background. No such distribution is presumed to for neural network. No. Now the interaction of an a priori distribution with neural network is again a very interesting question. Okay, and let's see if we can make some remarks for this. But I'm definitely covering such questions in the series of probability lectures that I'm giving. How does probability interact with neural network? So I guess, uh, yeah, I guess now it is time for us to stop the lecture and take remarks questions. Again, let me emphasize you have to place questions in the chat box. Please ask as many questions as you can. So can we take questions, Diptesh? Sir, as of now, there's only one question. Yeah, and that's not regarding this lecture. Uh, no. Ali is asking, would MIDSIM be discussed? I had some doubts with respect to the solutions provided. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, MIDSIM will be discussed. And uh, maybe in particular, can, since there are no other doubts, maybe we can take one of his questions and clarify. Yeah, OK. Uh, Ali, just uh, we have some time, so let's utilize this and maybe clarify a few doubts you had. Can you unmute yourself? Uh, yeah, hello. Hi. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In the question where we talked about where we had to tell whether a dis model is discriminative or generative, there I had a doubt. Uh, mm, yeah. In in the solutions uh, that were given, I don't think using the information we can calculate the probability of a beat given positive, like. Mm. Uh, in in this just as solutions oh. yeah so in the in the solutions what yeah. uh, is what is given is that we have the ratio of upbeats in positive and how many times upbeat occurs in total right so we yeah. have like count we have count upbeat and count upbeat comma positive so if we divide them like count upbeat comma positive divided by count upbeat this is probability of uh, positive given upbeat, right? No, what I meant was that uh, how many times upbeat occurs in positive class? Just like yeah. how many times fever occurs in cancer patient? Yeah, and we are dividing this by number of uh, total upbeats, right? Like the number of total fevers. No, so, no, so, you are, is... are you, so you are saying that the model answer is imperfect. That may be. Okay. Uh, no. Or the the model answer is imperfect, or the answer is wrong. I'm saying it should be discriminative, uh, because uh, because it is possible that 
is suppose we have a wide corpus of positive sentences and a beat occurs only in a small proportion of them okay no no you so have positive negative everything huh, positive so, negative everything yeah uh, yeah yeah out of the positive sentences a beat hmm. occurs only in a small proportion so probability of a beat given positive is less however uh, the how many times a beat occurs in positive and a beat occurs in negative that ratio is large i mean to take an example suppose there are 1000 1000 sentences uh, of positive and a beat is occurring only in 10 however only in one negative sentence a beat is occurring so the ratio of positive given a beat Uh, that is yours that is 10 is to 1 so ali But, what kind of uh, what kind of discussion is this i mean didn't you understand my cancer example uh, i understood the cancer example there so you have to, you have uh, do you not agree with the cancer example uh, in cancer example uh, you what you used was uh, uh, the total number of cancer patients right in the denominator like it regardless of whether they have fever or not but here the information that we have is a beat in positive and a beat in both positive and negative we don't have the information yeah. of total positives which we need like we in the cancer example if we had no, we have we have total number of positive examples also means uh, but uh, means i i i think it should be discriminative because like we are it's seeing how the whole question it says that you are trying to purchase a sentiment analysis software so i mean even don't you think a commercial i mean if a commercial model is being built a com- using a complete corpus the total number of all the features can be calculated and the final question is what kind of base ml model the engineer is most likely using so- Yeah, me. So most likely uh, it is going to be generative because from any corpora you can get the total number of all the features. That is that is true. That is true. But like uh, yeah. I'm just focusing on the main line in the question. Total number of time a beat appears in positive to negative. So if this ratio was high, that would mean a beat is appearing very likely in positive and very less likely in negative. So this information will tell us if uh, the like a beat is a good feature to use but, right? but there is also there is also a phrase after that and statistics like that yeah so if so if someone gave me the information that uh, for example the word uh, any word like good occurs almost equally in both sentences then uh, we would not like to use it as a feature right because good will not be able to discriminate between the sentences as it is occurring equally likely in both however okay. the re- a beat is occurring very more likely in positive and very less likely in negative so okay. we would want to use this as a feature right when we want to say a sentence like positive or negative given a feature then we would use a beat as but a but see how feature. the how the computation is being done i am first uh, uh, i am getting first of all all these statistics okay and then taking product with the prior probability so the the very fact that i am trying to find out how many times a bit appears or what is the probability of a bit given the positive sentiment that question itself says that it cannot be a discriminative model okay okay means i interpreted it wrong i guess yeah so we can have offline discussion also like uh, we did in some other questions but do you have any other doubt uh, yeah in the verse or equivalent right to left so hmm. in the se- solution it is mentioned that we uh, the conditional probability into ratio of counts but like it is ordered counts right like np coming after vp or hmm. means noun coming after verb and so on so hmm. if we decode from the opposite direction maybe like if we decode from the front and we got that there is a high probability of a noun being followed by a verb but in coming from the opposite so i think direction, i'll uh... i'll work out the solution in the class okay for everybody's benefit it is it is a matter of mathematical manipulation then then things will be apparent okay so it's a matter of organizing terms and grouping terms okay then it will be apparent okay so uh, any question came up in the chat box by the time no, sir, none. none okay okay so we'll meet tomorrow then thank you sir. thank you sir